Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is Richard Epstein, the Lawrence A. Tisch Professor of Law at NYU School of Law and the Director of the Classical Liberal Institute. Welcome back to Free Thoughts, Richard. It's always fun to be here, guys. So today I'd like to talk about labor unions, which I, I, I think is one of your favorite topics. We well, have many favorite topics, but, the, but uh, uh, labor unions I've heard you speak about quite a bit. Now, there's a story that we have about labor unions uh, that goes something like this. This we is the collective. It is we. the collective co- culture that, okay. that is in – 1890s, beginning of industrialization, there were a bunch of evil capitalists who uh, preyed upon workers and put them into horrible working situations, too many hours a week, no vacations, dangerous working situations. And then with a the struggle against them to unionize, they were able to secure for themselves safe working conditions, lower working hours and a better pay. And that's the reason why we have things like the 40-hour work week and the weekend to this day. And labor unions are an essential part of the American society and they keep everything sort of stable. Is that true? What's wrong with that story? Everything. Every, every single part of it? <laughs> I mean it is so far removed. I mean first of all, you just have to get the sort of temporal arrangements right. The labor laws that we have essentially date from – the first of the major ones is 1926, which is the Railway Labor Act, which was a catastrophe for the way in which the rails were operated because it legitimated feather bedding. And then we had feather more bedding, feather bedding because what happened in the terms of the rails is that they wanted to keep transportation going. The correct way to do that is to allow employers to fire people at will if they want to disrupt it um, and to punish anybody who tries to cut or block the tracks. What they did in effect is to say that workers have a vested right. They're not allowed to go out on strike. But if you wish to make any changes in work rules, you have to get the consent of the workers. Well, at this particular point, you've given guys a monopoly power over the thing. And that explains why it took 30 years to get the firemen off of diesel engines because you don't have coal anymore, but you still have firemen because you have to renegotiate the work rules. And that's a classic illustration of a situation where the abusive consequences of unionization dominate everything else. So that's the first point. Take a, another point on this issue is you want to trace the condition of the working person in the United States. Uh, there are many ways to do it. The simplest way to do it is through life expectancy as a kind of all-purpose variable uh, that kind of measures overall level of social production and success. Uh, Basically, life expectancy 1550 to 1850 is a kind of about under 40 years in England and the United States. By 1900, it turns out it's gone up to 46 or 47 years. This is, of course, during the period of the demonic mills and everything else going on. How do you explain the seven-year increase during this period? Well, at the time, there were many people who said, you know, this is just a blip. It's going to go back down again. We're basically Methusians at heart and Malthus told us what to think in 1798 when he wrote his book on population. But of course, things kept on going in the opposite direction. Now, what explains this kind of improvement is a complicated story, but let me mention some of the factors. The first thing is people finally figured out what pollution was and why it could kill. And that immediately meant that you now actually did go to public works, but it had nothing whatsoever to do with unions. It had to do with the separation of drinking water from sewage water starting in London and then going to other cities. And this is a very sensible public health manage. And what is it? It's funded by the rich who pay the property taxes and the benefits are shared by the poor. And so what you always see in these cases is the rich get some direct benefits, but the poor are always benevolent free riders under this situation because there's no way to exclude them from a drinking water system. Maybe small variations around the house or the local street, but the huge systematic improvement turns out to be greater. Secondly, when you talk about these demonic factories and so forth, remember where are these people coming from? They're coming from farms. Well, why are they leaving the farms and droves to come from the city? Well, there are no employers, demonic export people or terrible people on the farms, but farming is one of the most dangerous occupations on the face of the globe. And, you know, it could be sunstroke. It could be bacteria that's in the soil. It could be long hours, backbending labor. It could be kicked by a horse or whatever it is. And what happens is you give up all of that. You work for a dangerous plant, which is safer than the farm from which you came. And so this is a net improvement in safety. And if you simply assume that everybody's entitled to a risk-free environment, well, then the old and manufacturing factories look very bad. But if you compare them to the older situation, they start looking better. 
then, of course, there's competition in these firms. And, and that means you know, somebody actually can sell safety to workers by giving them better working conditions in exchange for lower wages. And you see other kinds of improvements. So you get the Westinghouse air brake in the 1890s. Now, all of a sudden, trains can stop more rapidly. And the kinds of accidents that you have for trainmen are going to be reduced because the technological complements are much better. All of this stuff now in the first part of the 20th century goes at an accelerating rate in part because the American patent system in the late 19th century was a veritable cornucopia of invention and all this other stuff. So you get the technology out, relatively free labor markets and all of a sudden, what do you see? By 1920, life expectancy has gone from 47 to 54, even taking into account the influenza plague of 1918. Well, how does this happen? The progressives always give this story and they can't explain the bottom line. And what it is is that technology gains and competitive industries are shared across the landscape and workers will benefit along with everybody else. Maybe the proportions are less. Maybe they're greater. Less in dollars but probably more in terms of utility on the grounds that the first dollars buy you a lot more than the last dollars that you get. So these people are leaving much better lives. And the labor unions at this point were very weak and they had absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with the gains. But does that does that exclude the unions entirely from the story or completely eviscerate the progressive case? Because if we've got we've got a trend going on, that's mm -hmm. you know, things are getting better and they're getting and we can we can list these factors, technological growth and knowledge are contributing to that, but that doesn't necessarily mean that unions either didn't weren't also a cause of it or weren't an accelerant of it. So well, they could say, could, look, things would have been worse if we didn't have unions well, or just because things are getting better doesn't mean they're as good as they could be. So we still need to fight to make them better. Standard argument. Uh, no, essentially the unions uh, – there's one set of situations in which unions are important and those are cases in which contractual actions are not supplied by the state. And this applied under segregation in the South. And essentially black organizations demanding wages under a circumstance where people are so precarious anyhow probably were a good thing. But the moment you have enforceable contracts, from the beginning, unions were a disaster uh, in terms of overall innovation. For one thing, by the way, they were very indulgent in the use of force against ordinary businesses. There's one story that I remember from the New York Times somewhere in 1912 in which the defendant in a criminal case says, yes, I did blow up the building of the factory which wasn't unionized, but I made sure that there were no workers in it. Um, you know, This is not the kind of conduct which is conducive. If you go back and you look at the struggles in the mines in 1920 and 1930 and so forth, they always reveal the same story. Non-union mines work at lower rates uh, than union mines. So what the unions do is they try to block their shipment of goods into the marketplace, which means that consumer plays higher prices given the violence and the uncertainty. So if you look at the Coronado coal cases from the mid-1920s, what does Justice Taft do? Cheats a little bit on the Commerce Clause and says if a union blocks the shipment of coal from a non-union mine into interstate commerce, the blockade is in interstate commerce. Why does he do that? Because state enforcement against unions was very spotty at that particular point in time. So all of these things are essentially taking place. And then how do unions start to improve something is a theoretical question assuming they're in place. First thing you know is we know one thing that they do, which is they engage in cartel-like behavior. What does that do? It raises prices and reduces output. That's going to hurt overall growth. In fact, serious studies of the Depression, uh, Lee Hanian wrote one of these, for example, in 2004. Uh, what you found out was that the best estimates are that the Depression went on another five or six years than it should have, more than it should have, because everything that was done by way of legislation under Roosevelt was cartel formation, whether it was in agriculture or whether it was in labor unions and so forth. And these things are inhibit, incredibly important microeconomic inhibitors. And these are cartels backed by the state so they can't cheat on them and the erosion is much weaker. So unions come out with a terrible role with respect to that situation. And also just take a simple measure. Um, the rate of productivity increases in the period which was highly hostile to unions when yellow dog contracts were enforced were very, very high. Yellow uh, dog contracts are? A yellow dog contract is a contract often required or requested by workers workers, interestingly enough, in which a worker says, so long as I work for you, I agree that I will not be a member of the union and I agree that I will not promise to join a union. And these contracts were enforced in a case called Hitchman called against Mitchell uh, decided by Justice Pitney in 1916 or 17. And it's an absolutely sound rule because what the management is trying to do is demand exclusive loyalty which will improve production. Now, what about workers and the efficiency gains? One of the things that many companies do 
is they actually encourage the formation of worker committees of one kind or another because they have no market power to shut you down, but they can give you a flow of information which you could then use to improve your processes. And the sensible firm says if we put up a suggestion box and we use your suggestion, you get a little bump in the paycheck if it's a small thing and a big bump in the paycheck if it's a big thing in terms of what you're doing. One of the things they did under the labor statute in Section 8.2 at the time was they made company unions illegal. Now, why did they do that? Because they knew that the efficiency gains that a company union could supply to a firm would make it more difficult for them from the outside to unionize it as part of an international brotherhood. And indeed, one of the sensible compromises that you could have in legislation is you get rid of all of the interfirm unions, which have cartel powers, and you allow unions to form on a plant-by-plant basis because they have very little market power that they could exert. But the progressive story, um, as told by Brandeis and Frankfurt and so forth, is done with such an abysmal ignorance of economic circumstances and empirical circumstances that it shows this particular deep contradiction. Progressives always talked about the need for empirical evidence, right, and detailed study. They didn't do a lick of work in that direction at any time. You read the famous Brandeis brief in Muller against Oregon. It is a series of string quotations to mindless sociological reports from the United States and Europe about the importance of government protection and labor. There's not a single normative argument there, a single descriptive argument there, which asks the question, hey, are you guys telling the truth? Or how do you explain the progress if, in fact, what you have is a series of retrograde institutions, which by your own prediction should have indicated that everything was going in reverse? So the point of unions, I mean, we look at the sort of development of the law and we have this – because cartels, the problem with the cartels or the problems that they face are people who want to not be a part of the cartel or undercut the cartel in some way. Uh, this is OPEC has always had this problem. It's with cheaters. Them. Yeah, with cheaters. Well, I mean it, it's it seems like working for less is not really cheating. Well, but, that was, but that's for, the term. It is, yeah. So then we have this – so basically unions, they're – they arise out of this, this sort of – you could have a voluntary union and say none of us are going to work. But then people started working. So they started using different kind of state-based aids and violence to try and stop people yeah. from undercutting them. And in and, and the 1890s and, and early 20th century, there are some decisions about unions uh, that were – some Supreme Court decisions that were very important um, that later were – but what was the – how was the legal status of unions initially? Well, it turns out the original judgment on the legal status of unions both in England and the United States was all done as a matter of common law principle and it was done as a combination of torts and contract law. If you start with the English kinds of cases, the first of the really important case that you have is a case called Allen and Flood from 1898 and there were two unions. I forget the name. One was the woodworkers and one was the iron workers and the iron workers, which was the bigger union, said either you fire all the woodworkers or we're going to walk off the job. They fire him and now in fact what happens is the woodworkers sue the other union saying you induced this guy to fire us and a judge named Herschel wrote the main opinion. He said, there's no inducement to breach of contract in this case because you were employees at will. So forcing them out doesn't make a difference. And this was a common law rule. Come to the United States, the same problem starts to arise. Um, and only now we have a Sherman Act in place passed in 1890. And so the great case on this, unanimous in the Supreme Court, was a case called Law Against Lawler, uh, which held that if a union goes and threatens a supplier of a given firm that it will shut its operations down by pulling off the workers so that it will no longer do business with a company which is a target of unionization. That's a collective refusal to deal which is a per se violation of the antitrust laws. So you can see the really different kinds of situations, the sort of narrow contract approach on the one hand giving way to an antitrust approach and which was much more developed in the United States at the time than it was um, in England. Of so this was just to say that, that – the Sherman Antitrust Act prohibited businesses from and colluding labor. to do this and it also said labor could do and it. So at this point, the issue is so important that it's the centerpiece or one of the two or three centerpieces of the 1912 presidential campaign in which Wilson – um, was a strong believer in unionization. He was a progressive coming out of New Jersey and Princeton. Uh, credentials like that never lead you in the right direction even in <laughs> 1908. And he strongly supported it. And the Clayton Act was passed in 19, oh, 1914. And what it does is it introduces a separation between these two areas that the 1908 decision had denied. And so they strike, they tighten the protections against um, um, businesses merging and so forth under Section 7 saying in effect uh, we can enjoy 
join uh, various kinds of mergers that substantially lessen competition. Uh, it's a tricky provision because it could easily be abused and unbalanced probably was a net negative but not a huge one. But Section 6 said labor is not an article of commerce, agriculture is not an article of commerce and therefore these guys are all exempted from collective – from the antitrust laws um, when they engage in their activity. And so you can see what they're doing. They basically overturn that. Come 1920 or 21, there's a case called duplex against steering. And this is another one of these Pitney opinions. And you can see what's going on. There are a bunch of companies that are unionized. And what they tell their – what the employers tell them is we're not going to sign another union contract with you in an area where there is no sort of National Labor Relations Act unless you take this fourth plant and you unionize it. And so they start running all sorts of boycotts of the – on the secondary nature against these guys. And the question is since they were aided by management, are they out from underneath the exemption? And it's a very tough statutory con question, construction question. And Brandeis says, nope, they are protected. And Pitney who wrote the Yellow Door contract position said no, that they are not probably the correct result both under the statute and certainly as a matter of principle. But the key thing to learn about this, if unions are efficient, right, then they should say, oh my god, this other plant is non-unionized. We have such a competitive advantage over that. Please don't unionize. <laughs> but they said exactly the opposite. OK. So someone who is a union worker listening to this um, – could say like, look, so there there might be some efficiency losses here, but I know from experience that the union has helped out. It's helped me, and it's helped the people I know. And my, you know, my dad and my grandfather were union laborers. And at the high point of unionization in the mid century was a time when, you know, those of us who weren't attorneys and doctors and knowledge workers, as we call them now, could earn a good wage and could be comfortably middle class. And as we've seen union membership decline and unions decline, it's become harder and harder for those of us. And so you can talk all you want about long-term progress and about efficiency, but the union helped us. Uh, right, well, the like answer us. is if you're a member of a cartel and your wages are increased by virtue of union intervention, of course you've been helped. Um, that's why majority people support the unions. We're putting aside here the dissenters like in the Friedrichs case recently of which there were always some. Uh, but the thing to understand is the only way unions could raise prices is essentially to reduce the number of workers available. So you want to do this thing systematically. You have to figure out what happens to the welfare prospects of those individuals who don't make it into union memberships and they don't make it into union memberships because these monopoly powers become partly inheritable by saying I'm an electrician in a union. My son will now join the union in preference to anybody else and take my slot when I start to require. So you have to do that if you're doing a social welfare. Thing. Then you got to figure out what about the cost of union goods to other individuals when they want to pay for it, and those costs go down, so their fortunes are going to be somewhat reduced. And you know the fact that you're better is true of every monopolist who makes his consumers worse off by raising prices. And then, of course, unions are much more dangerous than monopolies in terms of what they do because monopolists have no reason to interrupt production because it's only going to hurt them. Unions are bargaining with a manufacturer or an employer, and they will often pursue high risk, high return strategies. We'll go out on stripe. We'll disrupt production. We'll get a higher wages. In the meantime, people have to do without necessities. Children can't go on school buses. They have to stay at home. It's just all sorts of absolutely chaotic third party effects. And when I took labor law, I was told that these things ought to be ignored. And I said, why would you ever ignore them? When you guys start writing about monopolies and there's no disruption of supply, you talk about high prices as though they're wrong and you're right about that. So why somehow or other does that thing not apply? apply here. Uh, so the answer to this is that solipsism is not the same thing as an argument which explains not why unions benefit the people who uh, join them and profit from them, but why they are socially desirable. And nobody in the labor union tries to do this. The irony to understand this, I'm talking about social welfare functions and how competition leads to optimality across all persons and all resources. And these guys are talking about provincialism. And then what they do is they turn around and say, the problem about you, Professor Epstein, is you're a rugged individualist. <laughs> um, they get it exactly backwards. They are the ones who are essentially working against the public welfare under these circumstances. And the bromides that you hear from high political figures essentially simply obscure that particular fact by using these sort of nebulous terms, fair shot, fair share, and all the rest of that stuff. You could drown on unfairness if in fact it's just a substitute for what cartelization is.
What about is there another one of these terms that you could draw, you could drown in if it's used as so much as a unequal bargaining power? I mean, the the, the basic <sighs> idea is that no one, no one thinks. I mean, a very I think the common opinion is that workers just do not have any right to. They they are so hard up for a job compared to the business that they have no ability to actually negotiate anything except for if they want them to work for two hours an hour, they'll work for two hours an hour. Yeah, if they want to work for two and cent. Yeah, yeah, OK. But now what you do is start looking at wage levels in non-unionized competitive markets. And you see them systematically declining or systematically going up. Going and the up, answer, you imagine. see them going up all the time uniformly, roughly with productivity gains across the line. Why is that? Because it's an illusion to think that unions are a source of protection when they're a source of disruption, which will in the long run lower productivity in the short term, subject you to dues and the risk of strikes. But if in fact there's free entry into a market, if people are essentially getting too low wages and somebody else could make money, they'll start coming in. And now it could be either a new firm or it could be an old firm supplanting its supply or somebody putting a branch office out here. And that is the most solid protection that you get because there's no negative side with respect to that. And what it does is it means that nobody can basically keep some kind of monopoly rents if the competitive firms come in at an appropriate level. Now, is there a place for talking about bargaining power and inequality? The answer is no and yes. The answer for no is essentially in the standard models of a competitive economy, the equilibrium wage is uniquely set at the point where marginal revenues equals marginal cost. And so by and large, it's a take it or leave it kind of operation, which has a huge advantage because it means that the transactions cost relative to the transaction gains are extraordinarily low. One of the things that people like John Dewey, misguided soul that he was, said, gee, you get people bargaining for the good sale of goods over a back fence. That shows you've got a real market. No, it shows you've got a highly inefficient market out there because it's not thick. And what you just have to do is you now go into any one of these shops, you know, the old AMP or whatever it is. And what you do is you get online behind a guy who says, let's bargain over every price of every good in my market <laughs> basket and then see how people want to murder him. You get unique prices on a take it or leave it situation. Then everybody flies through the line because what people want is not high transactions cost. They want a high volume of transactions, which is what the major change in the supermarkets can give you. I've worked for some of these companies and what they will tell you is you see four customers on a line. You know, the fourth one's going to disappear. So the manager drops everything and opens up another cashier um, because you don't want to lose the sale and cleaning up something in the back room can wait 15 seconds and so forth before you take this into account. So these are in fact situations where there's enormous upward pressure on wages from these things. And so long as they're backed by productivity gains, you're not going to get around them. Whereas on the other hand, if you have to pay high wages because of a union, now what you're going to do is you're going to start to cheat, to scheme in an effort to cut back on the wages so you get back to a competitive level. You don't want to induce monopolization because what that does is it creates destructive bargaining, holdout situations. It makes everything look like the inefficient transaction at the back fence. And so in this regard, unions are an unmitigated disaster relative to a straight, smooth, competitive economy, which is why it is that the 95 percent of the labor force now, which is non-unionized, doesn't have any of the burp and hiccups that the union sector does unless these poor people are working in a union firm where a strike will disrupt their particular employment prospects. Now, the, the force that unions have, uh, something, the, the cartelization force that they have had historically and something that you wrote about recently in regard to the Friedrichs case, which you yes. alluded to. And, uh, but the, the, the race element of unions has always actually kind of set in the background and sometimes the foreground that unions have been not very nice to racial minorities and immigrants too as a, as a yes. historical thing. Uh, so some of the cases and some of the issues that – can you talk a little about unions and, and race? And how oh, sure. Have... I mean look, the key case in this is a case called um, uh, Steel Against the Louisville and Nashville um, Railroad and it arises under the Railway Labor Act which I mentioned earlier in this podcast, right? Where I said in effect in 1926 what they did is they made a single union have a sole monopoly power over everybody. Prior to the existence of this statute, essentially there were competitive unions. One was black and one was right. And the reason they segregated on voluntary lines is that the element of trust within the races, particularly in those days, was vastly greater than the element of trust across the races. And so what the employers would do is play off one union against the other and essentially the black firemen and the black uh, helpers worked about the same amount of money as the white firemen and the white helpers in their particular unions. 
Once you, in a case called J.I. case, introduce a situation in which the union can abrogate all previous contracts of all bargaining members, once they're a majority chosen, you don't have two separate unions. You have one union, 65 percent white, 35 percent black, say, and what they do is they now run a democracy. And so they vote, and this is what happened, to say that every job in the particular union, which was high paying, belonged to white workers, and every job that was low paying belonged to black workers. And they said to the firms, you accept accept this or we'll go out on strike. And so they got 21 railroads or something like that to go along with it. Now, you know, this is absolutely outrageous and it, it kind of shows you how it is a majority can vote to confiscate the wealth and prosperity of a minor, which shows you why it is unvarnished popular democracy in the union context works no better than it does in the political context. And Justice Hall and Fist Stoner is a kind of a Coolidge appointee. They actually met each other at Amherst College when they were both kids um, and so forth. He finally draws the line on this and he says it's a duty of fair representation. The white guys have to represent the black guys as well as they represent their own membership and we're going to enforce it. This is an impossible duty to enforce even when the violations are clear and they're still fighting over this thing one way or another a dozen years later. What it does in effect is it indicates that the power to separate is more powerful than the voice of participation. The exit right means more than that. And what the unionization statute did is to kill the exit right. In the Friedrichs case, now the question is what about exit rights and voice rights with respect to dissenters on union policy? And the problem is not as acute as it was with race, but you have exactly the same kind of interest. Some guy says, I'm better off without a union. I'm better off without a union even though I don't have to pay use to the union, even though I don't get benefits from the union. I just don't want any part of them. And the union says, you're going to be a free rider. And so therefore, we can charge you in order to run our business. And he says, you're not providing me with benefits. You're providing me with burdens. And so the court constantly is trying to figure out what to do with these guys. And instead of treating it as the economic matter that it was in the earlier days with low levels of constitutional scrutiny, they now are treating it as intermediate scrutiny, First Amendment kind of stuff. And it seems clear uh, that given the drift of the argument that the five conservative justices, including for these purposes, Roberts and Kennedy, believe that the free rider arguments of the old union guys are outweighed by the dangers of coercion in these kinds of settings, particularly since public unions are intrinsically political and include in their bargaining activity, lobbying activities in order to change the bargaining rules so that the line becomes evanescent. So virtually everybody on both sides with mixed emotions obviously think that the uh, current system called the agency shop in which non-union members can be charged a fee equal to the dues uh, for their economic but not for their political activities will go the way of all flesh. And so the libertarian elements of the First Amendment are counteracting the highly progressive and collectivist elements which dominated in the 1930s and 40s. How do these – the problems with unions that we've discussed play out differently between private sector unions, which is what we've talked about mostly, and then public sector unions, which we just touched on. Well, the public sector unions are in many ways much more vulnerable than the private sector unions, and which is one of the reasons why the 35 National Labor Relations Act did not include them. They only came back in in the 1960s. What's the explanation for that? Well, if you push very hard on a firm in a private union setting, the, unless the firm has a monopoly market in its product market, somebody else is going to come in and eat it for lunch. And so this essentially is an open invitation to tell people, you get too successful, you're going to lose your job as well. Back off a little bit because otherwise I won't be able to survive. And the second thing is that when you're dealing with a union, it's shareholders of private individuals which are reasonably well aligned in their interests with the company management. You start going into the public sector and generally speaking, you don't have free entry into this market. You don't have two police forces in the town of Glendale, California. You don't even have two public school systems. You don't have two of anybody. So the unions could push much harder on that because they know the substitutes are gone. In addition, um, they are shareholders as well as things. So they could get together a political fund. They could talk to their local legislature and say, sure, you want to support any anti-union legislation? We're going to make sure that you see the exit when it comes to the next election. And the unions, the teachers unions, the SEIU, these guys are absolutely past masters at using these kinds of techniques uh, so that it's pretty clear that a large number of legislators are hostage to union guys and will therefore do their bidding. This becomes most clear on when you start talking about work rules and pensions. Uh, it's hard to fire anybody inside a union context and the pensions come from people who retire early and what you have to do is set aside huge sums of money 
because even though they get small amounts of money per year, they get it for a very long number of years. It turns out once the pension is vested, you can't put your money in equity. You have to put it in fixed instruments so that your rate of return is going to be lower. And that's why you have these huge crises. And the unions are smart about this. They say, well, we're willing to give these pension benefits for all non-union employees as well. Well, the 90 percent giving a free ride to the 10 percent, well, there's a savage thing there. Now what they're doing is they're getting in a lie, right, very cheaply um, from what their activities are. And so if you look in a place like Illinois, uh, the state may be ruined. The city may be ruined by the cost of the public pensions that they have to bear. Taxes are going up. Civil services are going down. And the courts, which have always taken a very dim view of vested rights in economic areas, have systematically in Illinois and in California taken the position that every union contract gives you vested rights from the time that you take the job. So what you do is you have this one set of contracts which should always be suspect are the ones that are fully enforced so that any sensible reform legislation like Measure B in San Jose is going to be struck down by the courts. This is an absolutely tragic situation and it all comes out of the progressive era carried over from the industrial unions where it was a bad mistake to the public unions where it's a catastrophic. Wait, are you saying that that the obligations to the unions uh, that could sink the budgets of cities and states yeah. um, can't be renegotiated? That's correct. And without, they can be renegotiated. But they, they can't be unilaterally changed. Okay. So what happens is under California in a case called Kern, the rule says as follows. You're allowed to change unilaterally uh, the amount of money that you give to workers so long as the present discounted value of the package is not reduced, uh, which means that you could get a 1 percent improvement. But if you come up and you say, look, I have to lay off lots of current preachers, policemen, close parks, not buy books for libraries, do all the things that city do, their answer is we always come first. And that element is absolutely indefensible. Whenever you're trying to figure out how it is you do budget tiding, you may give certain areas priority over others. They'll never be absolute. And pensions, which are overvalued in the first place, would never be the area in question. So what we have here is a national disgrace with respect to this kind of issue. I mean, look, there are a lot of questions which are subtle and close with respect to labor relations. But all of these ones, as far as I'm concerned, are just clearly in one direction and it's the opposite direction for which our political wisdom runs and that's why you have the huge catastrophe we have today. We start with the assumption that the progressive story of 1910 is true and then we live its dire consequences today when it turns out to be manifestly and abjectly false. Well, it seems that labor union policies we have because I think private sector is down to 7 percent or so Under of workers. 6 percent. And uh, – so private sector unionization is going down. But we created this policy in 1935, which as you mentioned, and, I, and I'd like to, if you can embellish on this, it is based in a type of New Deal thinking that is mm -hmm. uh, frankly bizarre and, and quite insane and, and something that no one would propose today. That's wrong. I don't think I mean I don't think Paul Krugman would propose the kind of cardinalization measures of the New uh, Deal. I, I, I'm Are, sorry to say that may be true of the ineffable Mr. Krugman, but it is not true of the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. The Employee Free Choice Act is a provision that was done in order to have mandatory union membership on card checks and then to have compulsory bargaining so that if they bargain to an impasse, an arbitrator opposes a contract on the manufacturer. That is the law in California with respect to the agricultural sector and you see massive coercion and that's what they're trying to do in this public sector because they realize and they're right about this is a you – know, under current law, notwithstanding all of the unconscionable advantages that unions have in terms of exclusive representation, immunity from the antitrust law and the like, a well-run management will always beat a well-run union when it comes to major reorganizations. Uh, you'll never find a reorganization like the General Motors of the Ford plants of the 1930s. Uh, you look at the typical situation, unions win about half the elections, but these are typically elections in units which have 100 or 200 workers, nothing more. And one of the things that happen if you try and unionize and get tough on a small firm in a big terrain, it turns out that that firm which is unionized does not last very long. So those workers are back out on the street. So the success in unionization rate uh, gives you a two-year advantage. It doesn't give you a 20-year advantage and so forth. They're trying to reverse this and they're trying to reverse it with an eye on those things which don't get exported. Uh, there's no way that you could have the dishes bus from India uh, when you're running a fast food restaurant. Uh, hotel clerks that do this stuff, salesmen and salespeople, all of these people are essentially on-ground people. There'll be some erosion at the edge 
is you could buy things online and all the rest of it. But the hope is that they'll be able to get large unionization there. The response will be what's what it is to high minimum wages. Firms will try to reorganize their capital structure in order to reduce these things from happening. So they'll have fewer positions, greater automation. They'll change the mix of goods that they sell mainly to the upper end uh, so that what they could then do is find gainful ways to employ workers of higher income who are less likely to want to join unions anyhow. Uh, so this is a short-term palliative, which will be another long-term disaster. It almost passed when Obama came in to office in 2009. At this particular point, so long as the Republicans hold either House and Congress, it's DOA. Uh, but uh, make no mistake about it, the progressives' attitude is that the failures that we see today are not because their monopoly power was too great and their disruptions were too large. It's because their power is too weak, judged by declining unionization. The clear point is that what has happened in recent years is when workers understand that if they succeed in unionization, their, short their short-term gains are offset by their long-term instability. They don't want to join. That's why the UAW can't sell anything in the South because it managed by uh, strikes and various kinds of protective provisions to take General Motors from a workforce of about 500,000 in 1979 and reduce it to less than 10 percent of that amount when they went bankrupt in the mid-2000s. Um, so this is essentially that they're about. They don't learn from their mistakes because if they learn from their mistakes, they'd all be out of jobs. But it seems like this is really dangerous with public sector. I mean, what, I mean you've mentioned some yeah. of these, but if you look across Europe and you kind of get an idea, and I often say that sometimes you can tell if a country is kind of sliding into an economic collapse yeah. by the number of people who work for the government, basically, which are probably unionized, and also the youth unemployment rate. But, but these public sector unions with the cardinalization and the monopoly yeah. on two sides – uh, it it's can a, just run off the rails of at some point. But look, even in Spain and so forth, it's it's worse than that because one of the advantages you have in a non-unionized sector in America is you still have contracts at will. You're willing to hire if you know you can fire. In the European system, essentially to pry somebody out of a job is a major national hearing and that means the reluctance to hire high-risk, unskilled young workers is very, very great. But the minimum wage is doing this in the United States. I mean youth unemployment amongst black kids now is about 40 percent or more. In 1948, at the height of segregation, it was the same as the rate of unemployment for white kids um, and they were both vastly lower than they are today. So it's not that the unions do everything wrong. It's that when unionization is combined with other kinds of uh, requirements, minimum wage laws, mandatory pay rules, leave rules, whatever it is, and they essentially they price out the lower middle class. Somebody who's earning $150,000 a year will be hurt by these statutes. They may lose two or $3,000 in net benefits from these restrictions. But if you're earning $18,000 a year and somebody wants to impose a $6,000 charge on you, you're out of business and everybody knows it. Apple is never going to worry about this stuff. Tim Cook could bloviate all he wants about the importance of free and open access. They make four or $500,000 per employee. Walmart makes sixteen dollars or $14,000 and most of that surplus is coming from the, from the high-end employees. Minimum wage wipes out the surplus from low from low-wage workers. They know this. The unions don't know it. Bernie Sanders doesn't know it uh, because they don't bother to study anything about industrial organization. They just assume that whatever we decree, firms will follow because everybody knows that employers are stupid even though they're evil and they were <laughs> simply unresponsive to changes in cost and benefits uh, because they have infinite wealth. I mean that's the kind of way they talk and it's shameful. This isn't strictly on unions but talk of minimum wage mm -hmm. made me think of it. I'm often wonder why it is that progressives who are the ones who are pushing the strongest for a minimum wage um, are – and are typically big fans of government subsidies of things lean on the minimum wage as a solution to low pay for low-skilled workers as opposed to say outside wage subsidies. Well, they're wrong and what you said is more sensible. There's a danger with subsidies of course uh, and it's a political risk is they have to be put on budget and people will know it. Whenever you put something in the terms of a minimum wage law, there's no budget appropriation and the fact that it turns out that there are fewer profits, fewer wages and therefore less revenues to the government means that in the end it is a budgetary issue but it's not going to be processed through the committee structure in Congress in exactly that particular fashion. And so what they're doing in effect is they're picking an inefficient political 
an efficient political means which has an inefficient economic consequence, which probably explains it. Uh, the tragedy is that if you tried to ask the Republicans to talk about this, most of them are completely inarticulate on the problem. It's not that they think wrong. It's that they don't know enough to actually put the arguments out. The typical Republican response to any change in labor regulation is not this is a terrible thing because it reduces the scope of voluntary exchanges. Well, we think we should go from one to four rather than from one to eight. Um, and you know, you start doing those half measures. All they do is they double their demands and they're exactly where they want to be anyhow. So what does uh, Richard Epstein's ideal unionization law look like? Well, does there is an all, contracts of law, contracts at will with any and all employees shall be legal is all that you need to do and it would be nice to back it by constitutional protection. So if you go back to the period I'm talking about, the same year that they decided Lowe v. Lola, which said in effect that unions are subject to the antitrust laws, they also struck down a collective bargaining statute in a case called Adair against the United States and then seven years later in a case called Coppage v. Kansas, my friend Pitney again, right? I mean the guy is very consistent, <laughs> struck down the similar statute passed by Kansas, which was actually a hotbed for some reason of labor law reform or of a bad variety during this particular period. And if you could go back to that particular frame of mind and stop thinking about exploitation and start thinking about mutual gain, you will no longer believe that uh, contracts of employment are the equivalent of theft, which was the way you began the discussion, right? You said, well, these progressives know that you'll have to take anything when they give you a job. Do they really think that workers who are hard strapped for money are going to be take a contract which will leave them in expectation worse off afterwards than they were before? That's the fantasy. And all of the history history of this particular period shows increased vitality of labor markets, higher rates of participation, greater number of women coming into the workforce, um, actually even some modest improvements on the part of black workers which required a lot more to do given segregation and so forth um, and they just don't understand the history. Do you but, allow vo voluntary unions just like people? Well, I mean if people want to join together and form a union, sure, I'll allow them to form this thing so long as they don't have market power i.e. like the collective refusals to deal but I won't force any management company to to deal with them. Um, if they can present an attractive piece, that will be fine. Um, and in fact, as I said, there is an incentive to have company unions in these cases because a lot of times workers may have an instinctive distrust that an organization will help them overcome and that means in effect that they can basically uh, do better in coordinated activities than they could have done without a union. Most firms understand that. I mean, you know, I've been an employer. Every time I have a particular problem, I'm quite happy to put together a workers' committee if I think they're going to be able to solve this thing and to give them a charge. And the important thing that you do as a boss is you actually endorse and support their efforts. And you can't do that if it's a union because they're always stealing information from you in order to figure out how to run the next collective bargaining negotiation. So what happens is unions kill cooperation down at the, at, the, at the molecular level. They create the lousy form of labor regulations that a good employer will try to avoid. Thank you for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.